Hello and welcome to the Los Angeles Greek Film Festival event series. I'm Araceli Lemos, a member of the team who is organizing these online live events. It has been going very well so far and more and more people have been tuning in. I would like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded. The audience is not visible or audible, only our guests. And the video will be posted at a later time on our social media and website. So some people have already pre-submitted their questions for Nia, but I would like to encourage our live audience to submit also questions because we would like this to be a, a nice, lively conversation. So don't be shy. Include your name and your location and maybe a little bit about yourself so that we know who you are. And without further ado, I'm happy to be introducing today's masterclass with Academy Award nominated writer, director, and actor, Nia Vardalos. Hi, Nia. Thank you Hi, so everyone. much. Hi, Thank you. It's good to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, to start the event, I would like to also introduce today's moderator, Dorothea Pascalidou. Uh, Dorothea is a producer who we came to know from her first feature film, Worlds Apart, starring J.K. Simmons. Dorothea is a producer on the new documentary series, The American Runestone, with Peter Stormar, and was also the talent producer on Lionsgate series, Swedish Dick, starring Keanu Reeves and Peter Stormar. So thank you for being with us and helping us, Dorothea. Thank you, Arcelli, for the wonderful introduction. Hello and welcome, everybody. I would like start by introducing some of the highlights of Nia's career. We all know it. Um, so a little bit about her. In 2019, Nia wrapped uh, three sold out seasons on stage in her New York Times Critics Pick play, which she adapted from the book of the same name, Tiny Beautiful Things. Along with her on-screen work, Nia wrote I Hate Valentine's Day, and with Tom Hanks, she co-wrote Larry Crown, plus wrote the number one romantic comedy of all time, we all know it, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and its sequel, receiving an Academy Award nomination for Original Screenplay and Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress, winning the Independent Spirit and People's Choice Awards. She is also the New York Times bestselling author of her memoir, Instant Mom, and donates all proceeds from the book to adoption charities. To date, the information from her, her book has placed 1,700 children in permanent homes. Sonia, welcome. <laughs> Hi, I just had to mute myself because my dog was barking. I'm so sorry. Hello. You're part of it. <laughs> Hi. So would, can I ask some personal questions that I have for you yeah. about my own before I kick it off? I want to know, I really want to know, um, because I love your writing. I want to know what was the very first thing that you've written, even if it hasn't seen the light of day? What was it? Uh, when I was in high school, I wrote a book of poems because um, I thought that's oh. what I wanted to be. I'm Canadian, as you know, full Greek, but born and raised in Canada, and Alice Munro is an amazing author that I admired so much, and she wrote short stories. So I thought, I'm gonna write poetry and I'm gonna be deep <laughs> and meaningful. And um, anyway, my whole family's funny, so I eventually went into comedy. But I found that book of poems, and I opened it up so ready to be moved, and it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awful. <laughs> so why comedy? You know, everybody in my family is very funny, but we're not mean funny. We're, we're really, um, everyone has stories. Uh, in fact, my cousin, whose name is Tula, um, actually told, said the Vardalis family only has six stories, but we tell them over and over again. And that's just the way we are. We really are. There's 27 of us. We're all over. We're in Greece. We're in Australia. We're in Chicago. We're in two or three cities in Canada. And, you know, we're really close. And that's a credit to all our parents because when my dad and his brothers and sisters immigrated from Calabrita, they made oh. sure that we were close and that we all knew each other. So my cousins are like brothers and sisters. We're really close. Nice. So we have a question from Chris from Athens. You have inspired many people with your openness in your memoir. Can you talk to us about writing the book and your journey in becoming a mom? 
Well, to, so to tell people who may not know this, um, I got to adopt my daughter when she was almost three years old. And that came on at the end of a very, very long process of trying to become a mom. Something that I kept very quiet, very private, and never talked to anybody about. But it really is why I disappeared from screens, uh, from theaters for approximately five to eight years. Um, I was in the pursuit of motherhood and it was really hard. Well, then I got to adopt my daughter who I consider my real daughter. This was supposed to happen and I'm so grateful that I didn't have a biological child. Could I have said that at the beginning of my process through all the miscarriages? No, no, I couldn't have. So I decided to just be as brave as my daughter and write the real story about how I became a mom. And um, I donate all proceeds, as Dorothea said, uh, because I'm trying to be useful in this <laughs> in this life, you all made me a recognizable face and name. So how do I make sense of that? How do I find my purpose? And I realized that although I love to write comedies and I love to make people laugh and the sound in the theater is fantastic, I believe that my purpose on this earth is to get kids adopted. And so uh, that's what I do with my book. And it makes me feel really good. And we actually had something happen on Mother's Day. My daughter and I went to this place called Terranea here in Los Angeles. And we were standing on a cliff and we're very, very private people. You know, we don't like to be um, known. You know, we both wear hats and we're walking around. Well, anyway, somebody said, is your name Nia? And I was like, oh, it's going to ruin our Mother's Day. And I said, yes, hello. And they turned to my daughter and said, are you Ilaria? And she said, I am. And the woman turned and pointed and said, because of you, we adopted that little boy. <laughs> oh my God, that's a great story. That's amazing. <laughs> it was like, it's great work. yeah. So this is the, that was my long-winded way of saying, it is okay to be a private person. You don't have to share everything about your life. But sometimes there is a reason that things happen to you. So I think that the reason I couldn't become a mother biologically is because I'm supposed to be telling this story and get kids adopted. Thank you so much for sharing this, Nia. Niki Lambropoulos, a screenwriter from Patra, Greece, is asking, is it an advantage or a weakness for a Greek screenwriter to revolve around Greek themes consciously or even subconsciously? I think it's an advantage. I think it's an advantage to always write what we know. And I'm going to give you an example. Robert De Niro, a very famous Italian actor, has played many, many Italian roles, but we don't limit him to just that. So I think as a screenwriter, we have to pull from our life and then we can expand it into other worlds. Um, the play that Dorothea said that I just did, I play a woman on stage named Cheryl Strayed. She's blonde and she is Anglo-Saxon and she's from the United States. So I think I satisfied all my inner needs to tell our stories, but I also can do other things. So don't squelch what you know. Don't squish it down. Take it out, look at it and write it. That's my advice. <laughs> okay. Any surprises in your career? Maybe the biggest one. The biggest surprise in my career um, is, I think, moments where uh, I get to meet people that I admire. Uh, mm -hmm. People like Gloria Steinem, who was at the forefront of the women's rights movement. Uh, people like Ava DuVernay, who is a black filmmaker here in the United States. Uh, that's, that to me is just pretty cool to get to talk about other issues other than making movies. Mm. Okay, so we have Stefan Morrow or Moreau, I'm not sure, from New York. Hi, I'm a Greek American director actor in New York and have worked with Norman Mailer and Arthur Miller among others. How do you start writing on a subject? What is the kernel of your writing on a project? That's actually an excellent question. What I do is I use what's called the inciting incident. So it, when I was a writer and a performer at Second City, which is an improvisational theater in Chicago, 
we always called it today is the day. So if there is a woman who is in a convent in Germany, today is the day that she rescues a sheep from the edge of a cliff and meets a priest. Today is the day. So I always try to find the inciting incident. So taking, for example, my big fat Greek wedding, today is the day that Tula decides to go to college. It's not, by the way, my big fat Greek wedding is not for me, for me. It's not about romance. It's about a woman empowering herself. And um, so anyway, that's what I always use. The tiny, tiny inciting incident of why does this story have to be told today? What happened? Hmm. Next one up, we have Stellana Clearis, a good friend of mine. She's a filmmaker from Cyprus, great filmmaker. She's asking, no, she's saying, the romantic comedy genre has taken a dip in recent years. How do you think it can be revived? That's a very good question. I think that the romantic comedy needs to be modernized. I don't think that people want to see a movie about the quest to meet somebody. I think it has to be a little more organic than that because luckily we now know that we can be evolved people without having a partner. Yay! <laughs> so <laughs> that's the focus of the work that I'm trying to do now. I laid little kernels of that in my Big Fat Greek Wedding too, that my daughter is a little more evolved than I was, but you know, once a mother, always a mother. Um, and so uh, that's what I was trying to show. I was trying to show, I mean, my character Tula says to her daughter Paris, you don't have to get married and make babies. And that's the message that I'm trying to say across the world. We don't have to do anything. Right now we have to cure a pandemic, mm. but we don't have to do anything. Um, familial traditions can sometimes keep us um, harnessed. I think they also are the root of who we are as long as we don't let them define us in ways that can perhaps squash us down. So get out there and write your screenplays and make them and, and find your community with your own friends. And if you want to get married and have babies, that's your choice. I respect it. Thank you. As a single lady, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so before we move on to the next question, I have another question for you. Acting, which came, I think the writing came first, if I remember correctly, but, and then the acting. I, you know, happen? it's the acting first. The acting came first. I was always an actor. I did musical theater. I went to theater school. I did all this work. And then when I was in theater school, that's when I noticed that the teachers would tell me, I was in a classical theater school, I was studying Shakespeare and, and George Bernard Shaw, and um, the, the theater school teacher told me that I was limited, which was really surprising because of the color of my skin and because at that time, only Andrea Martin was on television as someone who had a little bit of pigment in her skin and curly hair like most of us. And I was just really surprised by that, but he said it in a way that was not um, insulting. He said, my advice to you is to write your own material. And back then, nobody was writing their own material. That didn't make sense to me as an actor. One night I went to a comedy theater called Second City where people improvised and wrote their own material. And I felt like, oh man, I'm home. This felt very uh, doable to me. So I got hired in the cast. They took me down to Chicago. I got my green card. I have dual citizenship so I could vote for Al Gore. And I really felt at the time like I was on my path as an actor. Well, then I got to Los Angeles and the same thing happened. I was told that I was limited because I didn't look like Nicole Kidman. And if you look like Nicole Kidman, more power to you. I don't like it when people say, this type of person is favorable over that type of person. I think we all matter. So I also don't like it when they say, she's a real woman, because a beautiful, thin, blonde model is also a real woman. So let's just embrace all of us. While I was here, I was told that because I didn't look like what was then the standard beauty, which was slim, blonde, 
boobs, no nose, I, I was going to have trouble getting work. And so I decided to make a list of all the things that had happened to me from my Thea Vula, who had a lump on the back of her neck that he, she claimed was her twin, to my wedding a year earlier, to all the things that had happened in my life. And I crammed it all into the space of a year. And I wrote my first screenplay in, uh, the first draft was in a three week period. And then I got it registered at the Library of Congress because I didn't even know about the Writers Guild. And I thought, well, I'll send it to the studios and see what happens. <laughs> and, you know, even though I knew Jim Giannopoulos from church, um, I didn't know that it's not that easy to get your screenplay made. Uh, so I jumped on stage and I started doing the material as a solo show. I told all the stories that you saw in the screenplay as a play. And um, the agents didn't come, the producers didn't come, some producers get, anyway, Rita Wilson, who is Greek, came, she sent her husband, Tom Hanks, uh, then uh, his partner, Gary Getzman, came, and the next thing you know, they're making my movie, and I'm playing the bride. So the acting came first, but I realized that there's power in our fingertips. So now, I love, love, love being a writer. I love writing things and seeing actors breathe life into the words. That's, that's amazing. Uh, and I realized that the best thing again that could have happened to me was that I couldn't get an acting job in Los Angeles because I learned that I could write. Exactly. So Bapsi from Los Angeles, you draw a lot from your real life. Do you ever feel any conflicts there? Yeah. Yeah. My mom actually reads my screenplays uh, before they're made to make sure that there isn't anything that's going to hurt anybody in the family. Um, the only thing she said about Big Fat Creek Wedding was, are you sure about Thea Vula? Because we don't want to hurt her feelings about the lump. And I was like, I think she'll be okay. And I asked her son, Tommy, and he was like, no, no, don't worry. Now, now, Thea Vula walks through the mall in Winnipeg and tells people who she is. I love that. I love that. So, uh, Diana Gergelos is saying, Hi, Nia. I think you are fabulous, and I am a big fan of your work. I am a fellow Greek American. I live in Phoenix, and I am working on my first screenplay. What tips do you have for writing humor? You do it so well. Thank you. That's very nice. I think we have to push the envelope a little bit. Um, things like um, weight jokes and race jokes just have, in my opinion, no place just no place. That's easy. That's, that's like a cheap target. So I would say stay away from it, but also don't edit yourself, which I know sounds like it's a conflicting piece of advice. But basically, I would just say this, write what you know, look at your family, make fun of them for money. <laughs> okay, great tip. So, uh, Patricia Skeriotis, an actress writer in, from Los, in Los Angeles, is saying, Calimera, she has two questions for you. She also started with writing poetry in high school, by the way, side note. So, first question from her is professional question. Do you, how do you handle distractions from finishing a writing project, if any? Yeah. Um, well, I, there's a big distra distraction right now. My daughter is home in online school. And so um, I have to be quiet and give her the space to, you know, be in school and talk on Zoom. And uh, the best thing I, that works for me is I turn the Wi-Fi off on my computer and I turn my phone off which is a luxury I can do now because she's not at school and I don't have to worry about an emergency call, uh, but I'm, uh, I think it works. Distraction, there is no place in it. You have to write until your fingerprints are no longer existing on your fingertips. Just write and... Uh, I love it. I turned off my phone too and my house phone rang. Oh, so weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry. Turn Turn everything off. That's so funny. It is it's off, but it connects with. I'm so sorry about that. No, no, uh, no. I mean about writing. About oh. Writing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Give me one second here. Um, yes. Okay. So I lost my screen. I am terribly sorry. I don't know what happened there. Um, sorry. 
there's a glitch. Okay. Are you good? So the other question, her second question, and I still have the glitch, but I do remember it, <laughs> is uh, in your book, Instant Mom, do you actually provide information about how to adopt? Yes. Um, one of the things that I was labeled with after I wrote the book was being an adoption advocate. And I'm actually an advocate of choice, period, choice. The last part of the book is if, if you're interested in adoption, there is a Q&A in the back of the book. It is in how to adopt appendix, which is what I was looking for. It explains what's domestic adoption, what's international, what is um, foster adoption, all the terms that all kind of sound the same. If you're living in the United States and you're interested in adopting, I highly, highly recommend something called a foster family agency, which sounds like foster adoption, right? It's a different term. A foster family agency is a free service in your state and you will work hand in hand with a social worker uh, to get matched with the child. It's pretty cool. Mm. Um, I, I have to apologize, but something happened with my screen and okay. I can't see the question. I can, can see step in from the team. Can you? Yeah, I can see. Hold on. Do you want me to look at the Q&A? Let's see. Not the Q&A, the chat. I'm, we're sorry, guys. Okay, let's see. Okay, here's a question. Dimitrios Kelecimitos? Wow, that's a good one, Dimitri. Okay, Dimitri says, <laughs> how much does it help to have a storyboard when pitching a script um, and you are in Thessaloniki? Hello. Okay, I think it really works. When you are going in, it helps to have a few images in pitching your script. What really helps is to draw the comps to say, this is a movie like this movie and this movie. However, this is how it's different. And then you say a few actors who could play some of the roles and then you pitch the entire idea, right? One of the things to stay away from is actual dialogue. Try and stay away from that. And because you'll get judged on your acting skills. And also they will hang on one piece of dialogue that won't make its way into the script. And then you're kind of screwed. Um, so long, story, long answer is yes. I think it helps to have a little bit of a storyboard. Not a lot save your money for when you're going to have to self-finance your movie. Okay. okay here's the I'm next. I'm back. I'm back. By you're the way. back. Okay. I will turn I, off. I have here George from Brooklyn who is asking, are you writing any new material? Yeah, that's what I was um, just doing this last week. I am writing constantly right now because I'm not filming. So I'm, I have about, I always try to have eight to nine projects loaded up on the tarmac, ready to go. Uh, even if four get made, I'm thrilled. And that's sort of the difficult thing about being a screenwriter. Some things just don't happen. I had a project that I was really pushing, just like a rock up the hill, Sisyphus. And um, the executive that I was working with got fired. And so it's dead in the water. So you just have to say to yourself, okay, okay, did it make me a better writer? Did I make some friends? Yes. So that's it. And you have to let it go hard. Okay. Cynthia Dadona, actress, screenwriter, on-camera interviewer. During these times, do you think live theater and one-person shows will adapt and be done virtually online and or in the future, a hybrid with audience and online? Or maybe new software will be developed so we can provide virtual after and applause. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> it is. I think there has to be a hybrid. I think we have to evolve. Um, I am such a huge supporter of the day and date release being in theaters and at home for, for two reasons. Some people can't get a babysitter. Some people are homebound for other reasons. And I think art should be accessible to everyone. So for many, many years, we've had an issue with the movie theaters that they would not release movies if it was within a three month window. What's difficult about that is if you're a filmmaker and you wanna release your movie, you need $10 million for prints and advertising to be in a theater. Then 
you want to release it on DVD and home box office, you need another $10 million to advertise it. And that money would be better served paying a crew, feeding your, your grip and electric team, than pushing it back into advertising. So I think everything needs to evolve. I think that theater can evolve and be filmed and reach the masses. Art is for everyone. And that, I think, is the silver lining of this terrible, terrible, terrible pandemic. Mm. And Anna from Burbank is asking, when you cast for your projects, what is the best thing an actor can do to stand out? And what would be your best advice for future actors entering the industry? Uh, you know, there's, a, there's something now that I think is much better than what we had. And that is on to, you can make your own talk show on Instagram. You can um, get anything going on another platform, TikTok. You can, on, there's another one called Thrill, I think. I don't know. I'm a hundred. Anyway, all these little different um, places where you can put your art out there is I think the way to stand out. You can't try to stand out if you're not working on your skills. So ultimately you have to be a good actor. Otherwise, you know, you're um, a media influencer, which also has a place right now. Mm -hmm. So Alexis Nichols is saying, hi, Nia, we met last summer after your performance of Tiny Beautiful Things in Pasadena, bravo. I'm the, fe I'm the fellow Greek American gal who was now a second year PhD in performance studies student at UGA. I was wondering if you could talk about how your involvement with that text turn play came about and any suggestions for anyone similarly looking to adapt another text. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so Tiny Beautiful Things is a book written by Cheryl Strayed. She also wrote the book Wild and many, many other things. This is a book where while she was waiting for notes on her first draft of Wild, while she was waiting for her editor, she became an online anonymous um, advice giver uh, called Sugar. The column was called Dear Sugar. And um, I was looking for something to do with my friend, Tommy Kale, who directed me in 24 hour plays on Broadway. And we had an amazing time. And he said, let's find something to do together and gave me the book and said, I think this is a play. So we contacted Cheryl Strayed, do that first, get the rights to the book. Uh, she became our partner and I adapted her book. And this is the best thing that could have happened, I think. Cheryl had ownership of the material, obviously, because it was so close to her, but also a very generous and open spirit. She has this ability to tell you when something's not working for her, as I wrote draft after draft of the play, but also will offer you something that might. So that gave me agency to say, no, that doesn't work for me. Do you have this? And we had such a beautiful relationship, Cheryl Strayed, Tommy Kale, and me, as I was writing a play from a book, which I had never done before, which by the way, I think you have to be a fearless idiot. Just try it. Just try things. Uh, so it took three years in the process of writing the play and going to New York and workshopping it. I filmed my Big Fat Greek Wedding too released my Big Fat Greek Wedding 2, went around the world twice to promote the film and then the DVD home box office release. <laughs> um, and then I went, got on stage finally in New York and Tommy Kale, he had directed Hamilton, Hamilton opened and then us. And the biggest surprise of my life was how hard it was, even though I've done so much stage. It was so hard to constantly be forming the material and learning it and doing it and be an open vessel because the material is very raw. And it was my first time doing a drama, mm -hmm. which was super scary. And the, the New York Times review absolutely floored me. I mean, I've never had, um, I've never taken such a risk and had such a huge return 
uh, except for with my book. And mm -hmm. so it's, again, it's a lesson. It's a lesson to push yourself artistically, to step outside your comfort zone, to try things that might not work, like the project that I just told you guys about that I wrote and wrote and wrote and didn't get made, and like the play that did get made. There are going to be successes and failures all along. There's going to be bodies across your path. And in the end, you have to just say to yourself, well, this is what it's like to be an artist. You got to work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Speaking of my big fat Greek wedding, Dimitris Cantaras from Thessaloniki is asking, would you consider a third big fat Greek wedding movie? Uh, yes, I would. And um, uh, I just... Uh, I love that family so much. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you guys something. I, we lost my dad in March. And of all the amazing outpouring of love and, and just people being so supportive that this happened to us, and I know many of you have had the same thing happen to you where you lose a family member, I got the most beautiful note from Michael Constantine, who plays Gus. And, you know, I, I have so many pictures of, Michael Constantine and my dad, Constantine, on set together. My dad plays the Psalty in the two Big Pack Creek Wedding movies. And Michael Constantine wrote me a note that said, love your other dad. Aww. I thought, my God, like, I just, I'm so lucky. We love each other so much, all of us. It's, it's yeah. really, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I've lost you a little it's bit a there. We didn't know the movie was going to be successful. Mm. Ah, there we are. Okay. okay, good. Ah, you know, the future sometimes can be a little glitchy. <laughs> yeah. So Rachel is saying, hi, she's a very big fan of yours. Yeah. What is your writing schedule and how many hours per day do you typically write? Um, you know what I'm doing, Dorothea? I'm turning off both my phone because sometimes it helps with the internet. Okay. Like yeah. off, off. Okay. Um, my process is um, I get up pretty early and mm -hmm. I don't read uh, anything, no news, nothing, because it's going to ruin your day. And I have coffee, get my dog outside, get my daughter up. We both exercise at home now. And then I'm sitting at my computer. I make sure I, you have to shower and get dressed as if you're going to work. I think it puts you in a different mindset than writing in pajamas. So that's what works for me. And I have to be sitting at my computer by 9 a.m. And I write until it's not coming anymore. Mm -hmm. If it, I say, I think you have to give yourself three chances because you can't force three creativity. So if it's not coming anymore, I get up, I pace, I walk, I lay on the couch. I try and think, I p try and figure out the chess moves of a character what they want. If I'm blocked, it's usually, what does this person want? Not what's their motivation. What do they want? And then when my daughter finishes school at about three, I'm finished too. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important to live a life to write a life. So yeah. we go outside. Right now, it's, it's not like we can go to the mall, but we just try and do things, uh, walk our dog and just do other things. David D. from L.A., how has it been different writing scripts, plays, and your memoir? What was different and what was the same? Uh, the memoir was difficult because it wasn't like I was pulling from my real life and then exaggerating or imagining the, the rest. It was my real life. So that um, made me really sweaty. <laughs> I, was like, I was really afraid. I held some things back that are only my daughter's. Uh, they, that's her story to tell, not mine. Uh, so what I did is I put everything in and then I read through it and pulled stuff out that's ours. Uh, for screenplays, I don't really outline. Uh, if I'm writing about something that I know so well, like my Big Fat Greek Wedding, I don't write an outline, I just write. Mm -hmm. And then um, for writing a play, well, I had the book. And Tommy Kale, the director, always had such good advice. Whenever we were lost, he would say, go back to the book. And I would always find the answer in Cheryl Strait's words. Whether I used a passage or not, 
I found a piece of connective tissue uh, when I was crafting the play from uh, the book. Uh, Melina Chiaverini, an actress and a writer from Beverly Hills. Um, you're lovely to listen and see, watch, I guess. Can you shed more light on financing your own film? I guess the first one she means, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I wanna go back to the question about the play. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you about writing a play. You are limited in locations it, with a play. Unless you are going to use two chairs on stage and then you decide you can go from an airport terminal to India, that's doable too. But there's something I think very freeing in limiting your locations because then the onus is on the dialogue. And that's what people come to a play to see normally are the human interactions and the emotions in a play. So that really helped me too. We set my play in a kitchen and that was great for me. I didn't have to worry about where we were going. I just had to worry about what we were feeling. So I like mm -hmm. that. Um, in terms of financing our, our movie, it was really difficult to to get financing for my big factory wedding called um, Love the Script, Lose the Girl. So that happens. Unfortunately, sometimes you need a name actor in your piece. And that is just a horrible thing. But sometimes it's okay to grasp this. It's show business. There is a business part to making the movie. And so if you can get a name person attached to it, you can sometimes get your financing and keep your costs low. Keep your costs as low as you can for your independent feature. Because if you get it into Sundance and someone wants to buy it and it only costs $500,000 or $50,000 or $5,000 or $500 because you filmed it on an iPhone, you're going to get yourself a sale. So some people are coming back with more questions. Niki Lambropoulos, a filmmaker from Greece, is asking, your one single advice or your top three for a screenwriter to break into the industry? Um, I'm going to say this. If you can, write every day. I understand the uh, boundaries of having to have a job. And so if you write in the morning or you write at night after your job, just try to write every day because it's a muscle. Um, the next thing is make friends with actors, have table reads, hear it out loud, um, and see who has a connection. Sometimes somebody has a feel. There's just somebody who's in the industry. You never know. Some, a fairy godmother will appear and have some money and want to finance your project. Dimitris Cantara's second question from Thessaloniki, filmmaker. How do you pitch a screenplay? Hmm. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I think to pitch a screenplay, you have to play all the characters, uh, tell the story from beginning to end, keep it short, uh, and practice on a friend. Uh, usually you have to buy them lunch, and then you tell them your screenplay story. Um, have notes, sometimes on cards, but don't go in and just read it. Because if the studio wants them to read it, they'll just read your screen, their, your outline. And that's it. I just burped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, so, Yasuniamu, so happy to see you with all the episodic networks maximizing viewership. Do you think that this time it's more advantageous to pitch a project for Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, et cetera, rather than pitching a movie. Love you, honey, Anna Giannotis. Hi, hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. <laughs> hi, Anna. Yes, I think so. I think that Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Hulu, they're all doing very interesting work. And also you can make very complicated, interesting characters on these streaming services because you don't have to worry about advertising money. Sometimes on the networks, which also do good work of shows like Grey's Anatomy and This Is Us are still churning out really complicated, interesting characters. But what happens there is there are advertising dollars that are going to finance your show. Whereas on Netflix, Hulu, all these other places, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about offending uh, Maxwell House coffee. You don't. 
So mm -hmm. that's why I think that place is, a, the, all those places are very freeing. If you can get in there and pitch, do it. Athena Inembolidis, how involved, educated do writers need to be on the business side of production of a film? I think that it's best to stay artistic and not worry about the business side of your film. Leave that to producers like Dorothea. Um, when, when I write a screenplay, I don't worry about what the budget is. So if I want to set a big, big scene in the Colosseum in Italy, I'm gonna do that. And then it's up to your producer to give you notes and say, is there any way you can set that scene in a field with four people instead of at the Colosseum with 40,000 to bring the cost down. That's what a producer does. And so don't, don't limit yourself as you're writing. Let your imagination soar, set a scene in space. That's your territory. And that's why we're not loved. <laughs> so Brian Sebastian is asking how do you see the world of indie films right now I also did interviews with you for my big that great wedding by the way <laughs> hi uh thank you thank you for giving us the press back then because we certainly were not um an easy sell at first so thank you uh I think indie film is in trouble there's just uh no doubt about it Right now, we are um, globally in a, probably a recession. Um, so it's going to be a little bit difficult. However, the film industry is cyclical. Everything comes back, right? Everything. So during these dark times, what are we going to do? We're going to write and we're not going to give up. That's what I suggest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yanis Casella from Athens. How have things changed as far as on-screen and off-screen multicultural, sorry, representation since the beginning of your career? Oh, that is such a good question. First of all, my dog is barking, Ella, do the, Louis, Ella. Nope, no food, and he won't come. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it is a beautiful thing right now. I think we have absolutely amazing, amazing projects with people who have, uh, I keep saying this term, but pigment in our skin. We have Rami, who is an excellent show. We have all these shows on all the little networks, like Apple, not little, but you know, they're huge, but like Little America. We have all, all these shows that are telling our stories. Uh, it was difficult. It was so difficult to get people to make my big fat Greek wedding. They wanted to change it to my, big, you know, my big fat Italian wedding or my big fat Hispanic wedding. Great. Those stories also need to be told, but I wanted to tell our story, a story about Greek people. And, oh, I'm so sorry, you guys, my dog keeps barking. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I think it's great. I think there's so much material now. I think Mindy Kaling is telling her stories. You can flick through the, any, any of these networks any of the streaming services and i think there's representation and it's great mm -hmm. michael zervos filmmaker from uh the us was there a time where you were in a rut career-wise and trying to restart or revitalize yourself what did you do to rise above a low point uh, yeah, the truth is that after I was in the pursuit of motherhood, um, the phone stopped ringing. And at that time, it was a relief because I just wanted to um, just, just write and get off camera and just be left alone. And um, I didn't leave acting. I didn't quit. I just didn't want to act at that time. And then um, when the phone stops ringing, I didn't see that as a negative thing because in my experience, I always just think, look, if, my, if no one's calling me, I'm going to call myself and give myself a job. So I found this screenplay, My, Big, um, my Life in Ruins. I hadn't written it. Uh, a lovely writer named Mike Reese had written it. I think he wrote it for Jennifer Aniston, actually. And um, he brought it to me at Play... I took it to Playtown. And um, I said, I think I'm ready to go back on camera. And I found a movie that takes place in Greece and they just jumped at it. And um, all of a sudden there we were at the Acropolis. It was amazing. I'll tell you guys a story about Alexei Georgioulis and me. 
your ghoulies. So your, your ghoulies. <laughs> we were in Athens and um, we were driving back from Olympia to Athens and he was speeding, not bad, but I was so being my character and being like, you need to slow down. And he was like, stop being your here. And I was like, stop being poopy. Anyway, we got pulled over by the police <laughs> and we thought for sure he was going to get a ticket. And instead they just got us to get out of the car and take pictures with them. See <laughs> what you get for being famous. Dimitri <laughs> Kipriotis from Sydney. Nia, thank you for everything you do. What do you consider hosting, writing workshops or other types of workshops as well to mentor other Greeks who aim to contribute their talents to the world of film but do not know how to enter into it? Yes, I do actually. Um, I want to get my dog a snack so he stops barking, but we have about 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, I do mentor like, six to eight writers a year. And hold on, Louis Ella. Oh, I'm going to give him this. And then he's going to, yeah, I have something he can eat. I mentor about six to eight writers a year through the Writers Guild. They assign people to me, and I love it. It's, um, it's a moment of connection, it's a way of giving back. And it's, it's really great. So that is a program through the Writers Guild that you can apply to. And you can specifically ask for me if you want. Um, the other thing that I love to do is workshops. So with Cheryl Strayed and another friend, Krista Vernoff, who is actually the showrunner on Grey's Anatomy, we're going to do a workshop that benefits the Actors Fund in January. So that will be announced soon. I'll announce it on all my social media pages. Um, at this point, I think it's Twitter and Instagram. I'm off Facebook until they stop running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from Alexis Nichols. Where have you found inspiration during quarantine? Uh, I had about six or seven projects that I always wanted to write and I didn't have time. So that's what I've been doing. I've been just... Um, finding little, um, I, what I do is I never write things at the same time. I won't write one screenplay one day and then zip to the other one. I try and be monogamous in my writing. <laughs> so okay. um, that's what I do. Okay, great. Guys, uh, if you have any more questions, uh, here, they do. Uh, another and again, Alex is Nichols, big fan, I guess. Where have you, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Maria S., excuse me. What are your thoughts about shooting in Greece? Oh, I absolutely loved filming in Greece for My Life in Ruins. It was an amazing experience. We had to stop filming at least once a day, no matter where we were, to meet the mayor and take some <laughs> pictures. And I would say, I'm sorry, I think we just met the mayor. And they were like, no, 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 that was the mayor here. And no, we meet this mayor here. <laughs> so we met, we met a lot of mayors. I love filming in Greece. The crews were amazing. I remember being on the steps of the Parthenon and having just this absolutely lovely man who was our background actors coordinator. And he would say, um, and I just loved how how sweet he was because you don't have to yell right mm -hmm. and we weren't going to yell on the steps of the parthenon no way <laughs> and so I, I you know i have this really great picture he's in the background of it, of it actually and i always think about his gentleness it's just his gentleness on that set so yes, that's a long answer to say, you yeah, should, I'd love to come back. You should reconsider shooting there. We have a great cash rebate now. Yes, I know, <laughs> I know, let's do it. So Nia, that was the final question. Thank you so, so very much. This was so insightful. I was very glad to be your uh, moderator, <laughs> even with my problems and my glitches. <laughs> You're Thank great. you for your time. And I guess Araceli can close this if she wants to. Thank you so much, Nia. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, people sending their thank yous and that all of this was very useful and that you're a great inspiration for all of us, for many actors oh, and writers. Okay. <laughs> I'm just reading the <laughs> from the chat. Thank you so much, for Nia, for giving us your time. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Thank you so much. I just love it. I'm trying to look at the chat to say hi to people. Um, Dorothea and I are friends and as Aratelli is too, like we all know each other and it's just such an honor to be able to use Zoom um, to mm -hmm. connect with people all over the world. This has been really interesting. Thank you. I'm sorry about my dog. You know what I'm letting him do? Lick my coffee so that he'll stop. <laughs> It's okay. It was a great addition to our conversation. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, okay. LA Greek Film Festival. Yes, and thank you to our audience that has been here every day tuning in. And please stay in touch. The festival has been um, prolonged for one more week because people were wanted to watch every movie. And uh, Nia, I know, is also ready to watch <laughs> enthusiastically. So yes, one more week. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.